Hi, everyone, and welcome to Free Advice Friday. My name is Amy Collins, and I'm here every Friday at 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Eastern to answer your questions. And I would love to be of help in any way I can. I do it a couple of different ways. I have a Zoom webinar that anyone can join me live. We have a bunch of people on live right now. We've got Bob and Anna and Wendy and Ellie, Kate, Linda. We got a bunch of people and they can ask me all the questions they want. All they have to do is go to the Q&A box, the, the question and answer box on, the, um, on the, the Zoom webinar and type in any questions they may have this week and I will answer them. I also broadcast this live on Facebook and I am trying to keep an eye on that as well. So I've got your back. Uh, but those who are on the webinar do tend to get first crack at the questions. And if you're, um, if you're look, watching this on Free Advice Friday, oh, good morning, Jane. I see that you're already there. Lovely to see you. Don't know if you guys know Jane Ubell, but she is the powerhouse brain behind Bedside Reading. You should to if you're an author, you should completely go check out bedsidereading.com. And the programs that she runs for my authors, I'm just so enamored with. All right, so I've got the question box open. I've got the email that has been sent to me this week for a question, and I've got Free Advice Friday wide open. What else can I do for you guys? Please type your questions in. If you'd like to join me live anytime in the future, please feel free to go to amysadvice.com. amysadvice.com will take you right to the page, which will allow you to join us free. All right, so... Time to stop acting like, I, uh, like I'm, I'm getting started and start to ask the questions. So the first question, the one that was emailed in this week, was from D. Uh, just, I'm just going to use first initial because I don't have his permission to use his name. Um, but he published a book a few years ago. He had a friend self-publish it for him. Uh, there was a couple of books that came out under a pseudonym. And this friend who published it for him did nothing in terms of promotion and there wasn't, and truthfully guys, publishers don't do much in terms of promotion. So I'm not surprised, nor am I upset by that. So very few books were sold. Is it possible for David to remove them from the self-publishing realm, turn around and find an established publisher that might be interested once, once you know, he's ready? Uh, is he obligated to explain that they were self-published first with little result? Or can he simply give them up as new titles and try fresh with this new route? All right. D, David, first names. Uh, David, here's the thing. You will not, it never serves us to hide or to lie. Your books were self-published under a pseudonym. There's no shame in that. There's no harm in that. Yes, there are some agents that will not work with books that were already self-published. Okay, but there's tons of agents that will and lots of publishers. So simply querying the agent and, and putting the query together the way you would any other query. And at the very bottom, just list in one simple sentence, these books were, were um, that they were floated, that you, you, they had a trial publishing under a pseudonym, under a fake name, so that you could work out the kinks and get notes and edits and beta readers. All of that's true. You never did a true trade launch. Your book was not launched properly. If somebody just, what happened was your book was printed. It wasn't published because a published book, lots of work goes into publishing. So, but you, you should never hide that guys. Um, agents, publishers, they will eventually find out somebody will say something. Do yourself a favor. Always be open, upfront, honest. If your book was put out into the marketplace at some point under a pseudonym and it didn't go well, there's a really good chance that you could make the argument that your book was not published, that it was printed and it was printed for other reasons, but don't hide and hide it. That's my advice to you. Uh, let's see, Denise is saying she noticed that I had a webinar with Daniel Hall a couple days ago, but she got the notice too late. I'm sorry, Denise, that was all my fault. Could you tell us what it is and if it's recorded? It is recorded. Guys, there is a replay. I put together a new class, totally free, called Get Ready for 2020. It is a six-month step-by-step plan on how you can plan out your marketing and your sales plan and put a program together all on your own. What I do is I walk you through. I say, okay, in the month of October, you know, in the next few weeks, you need to finish this up. And in November, you need to do this. 
And in December, I want you to work on your website and I want you to put this in place and that in place. And then in January, you need to do this. And so I, I marched people through the next six months and I, we put together a calendar together. So if you go to bestsellerbuilders.com slash 2020 replay, I'll drop that in the chat box right now. And I will also drop it, this time I'll remember to include everyone, I'll also drop it into Facebook Best Seller Builders.com 2020 Replay. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm dropping this link in everywhere. Um, this is a new class based on a number of programs that I have been uh, doing live. I went to Manuscript to Marketplace. I taught a number of classes at the Writer's Digest Conference this year. Um, so what I did was I took several of the classes that I've been teaching and I put a calendar, a build a calendar uh, webinar together for you guys. There you go. So there's my advice. Uh, Denise, thank you for asking about that. And I'm sorry that you got the notice late. That was all my fault. I forgot to tell people about it. But bestsellerbuilders.com slash 2020 replay, 2020 replay. That'll get you there. Thank you. All right. Linda is asking what I think is the most important social media venue to concentrate on right now. Great question. Let me answer that, unfortunately, with kind of a long answer. Linda works with an author, a very, very talented author uh, that we absolutely adore, Rick Lenz. And he has written a number of different novels. And, and some, of them, some of them veer very deeply into fantasy or, or they, they kind of touch upon some time travel. But he's not a fantasy author. For the most part, his books are strictly literary fiction. So Linda, for Rick, what I would suggest is that he focus a lot on Instagram and on Facebook. That makes the most sense for him. Uh, if, if you are a sci-fi author or a horror author, Twitter has some amazing, amazing groups and tags and hashtags that you want to jump on. Um, and so the horror, I think Twitter, for a lot more for people who have written books about role-playing games and gaming and game theory. Um, the gaming book world is huge. Twitter is definitely a great place to hang out. But Instagram, Linda, for books, you know, for literary fiction, I would say if you can only pick one, focus heavily on Instagram right now. That being said, that is where you spend your time. You need to spend your time everywhere your readers are. But if you're looking on where to really dig in, Instagram and Facebook. Now, for some of you who have written cookbooks or self-help books, for those of you who have written memoirs that have an inspirational aspect to them, um, people like, oh, and, and Bob Eckstein, who, Eckstein, sorry, who's on the, the call today and, um, and who has a new book that has just launched this month. Everyone's a critic, it's called. Bob is a, has collected all of these amazing New Yorker cartoons. The New Yorker, and, and he is he's so deeply steeped in the illustrator and cartoon world. And he has pulled together the second in a, a, a glorious, the first book uh, became an instant bestseller. You guys have to check out the second book, Everyone's a Critic. It's a collection of the New Yorker cartoons. You, you Please go check it out. But Bob, for instance, I would suggest that Bob spend a lot of time on Instagram and Pinterest, especially if he's going to spend any money on advertising. If I were in charge of, of a cookbook author or a illustrator or a, or a cartoonist publishing plan, I'd be focusing quite heavily on Instagram and on Pinterest, mainly because the ads that you run there and the boosted posts and the boosted pins that you run there last so much longer and get such a broader reaction and a broader and deeper, not just broader, but deeper a number of views. So I have not had a lot of luck, no matter what category I've chosen, I've not had a lot of luck advertising or promoting my books when I want to spend money on Twitter. But I have had a lot of luck on Facebook and I've had a lot of luck on Instagram and even the most luck on Pinterest. So Linda, that is when you say what to concentrate on, there's the long answer. It depends on your category. If you've written a book, 
telling people how to, you know, get to retire in the next three years by using real estate, you probably want to go to LinkedIn and maybe a little Facebook. But if you've written a book on, on reaching that, you know, is going to teach other lawyers how to run the contract world, I'm afraid that's probably more LinkedIn exclusive, maybe a little Twitter. The answer is it depends, but those are my long-term answers. All right. An anonymous attendee, hello, anonymous, nice to meet you, wants to know if a price barcode is important for libraries. No, not at all. Now, Barnes & Noble and a lot of independent bookstores actually put right in their paperwork that they strongly prefer, and in some cases, some places actually require a price-specific barcode, but libraries are not not requiring a price specific barcode. My camera is jiggling guys. So let me just fix that real quick because that is bugging me. Uh, a price specific barcode is very important to bookstores, very important to many retailers, but not to libraries. So Mr. Autonomous, you're in great shape. If you do not have a price embedded in your, and let me show you guys, for those of you who don't know what that means, there's two different ways to do a barcode. Let me show you. This is my new book that just came out with Daniel Hall and John Rhodes, Daniel Hall, amazing author, wrote 99% of this book. He let me put my name on it because I got to write some of it, um, maybe a little more than 99. Um, but uh, this book, you should really check it out. But this is the new book. It just came out this week. But if you will notice, that barcode right at the end ends with a nine, here, let me put my hand behind it so you can see, a nine zero 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 zero. That means that the price is not embedded in the barcode of this book. And I did that on purpose. Now here's, I did not know this question was going to be asked. So I'm hoping that one of, there we go, this is golden. And then this book, which I am working with, you will notice that the end of the barcode ends 51800. 51800. That means this book is $18. This book, who knows how much it is? because it ends 59000. If your book does not have a price code embedded in the, uh, in the back, then it will always end 9000. But if your book does have the price embedded, it will end five and then the, the, the next four digits, either 1795 for a 1795 book or 2000 for a $20 book. That's how it works. Bookstores want the price embedded in the barcode. So when, tick, when they hit it real quick with their gun, the price comes right up on their computer. But libraries don't care. All right. Guys, this may be a very short Free Advice Friday. I do not see any other questions. Now, it may be because of the holiday weekend. Uh, there's a million things that uh, could be happening. Last week, we went well over an hour. Um, but if you don't get the questions in, I'm going to go and have a Diet Coke. Let's see. Sue has some questions. Let's see what's going on. Bookstores carrying her books. Number one, her three book series are workbooks. Yes. And about a third of the pages are worksheets. And it's in a very, very small niche. It's about gymnastics. Uh, when they go through Ingram Spark, uh, she wants to know if that will help them, help us get into them, right? I'm assuming you mean bookstores? Uh, yes, Ingram Spark. Can you explain your bookstore program? Okay, so let's talk about Ingram Spark and how they work with bookstores. I would like to to very quickly go over how print on demand and Ingram Spark works with the marketplace and who they are. In, the Ingram family, based in Laverne, Tennessee, owns a lot of companies. One of the companies they own is called Ingram Wholesaler. It is the largest book and entertainment wholesaler, meaning they also do DVDs and a number of things, but they are the largest book wholesaler in the world. Uh, and they sell to music stores and bookstores and gift stores and Costco and Walmart. And they sell to, oh my gosh, they sell to everyone and libraries. But we're only talking about retailers right now. Ingram Wholesale is one division owned by this family the Ingram family in Laverne, Tennessee. There's also Ingram Distribution, which is a different division altogether. Sounds quite similar, but that is a company that gets hired, that publishers will hire, and they will pay a great deal of money to have that division sell their books directly into bookstores, directly into libraries, and into other wholesalers. And the Ingram Distribution arm has a sales team, a marketing team, a customer service team. They have 
hundreds of sales reps, mm, that might be exaggerating, dozens of sales reps that go out all over the country and get in the car and drive from store to store and sell books. And they, and they, they, they drive to library to library and they sell to librarians and they, and there's sales reps that do nothing but sell to Costco and Walmart. And that's what, that's their job to pitch books and to sell books to these chains. But Ingram Wholesaler doesn't have all of that. They're passive. They're a big old warehouse and they sit and they wait for orders to come in. And when those orders come in, they will grab the books off the shelf and they will turn around and they'll ship them to whomever ordered them. So there's Ingram Distribution, which is a very active, proactive division. And they take very few, teeny, small percentage of publishers and you pay through the nose for the privilege. There's Ingram Wholesaler, which also takes only a small percentage of the existing publishers. They're not going to sign you up or allow you to sign up with Ingram Wholesaler unless you can prove to them that you can make them hundreds of thousands of dollars. There's no reason for them to sign you up. You can always go through someone else. But here's the division that Sue is asking about. Ingram Spark. Ingram Spark, in many cases, um, it often gets confused with Lightning Source, but it's, it's a little different. It doesn't matter how it's different. But Ingram Spark is the self published small press single title, or if you've only got a few titles, it is the interface that works with that works with publishers and authors who want to self-publish or who to start their own small publishing enterprise, micro publishing, indie publishing. All of them go through Ingram Spark. Ingram Spark is a different division. They are a print on demand company. Print on demand, as you know, Sue, is uses digital printing combined with distribution to create a business model called print on demand. If you put your three workbooks into Ingram Spark, they're about 140 pages each, you said, and, and that's and a third of them are workbooks. That's terrific. Ingram Spark will then list your book with Ingram Wholesaler and bookstores. And not too many libraries are going to want a workbook, but bookstores and gift stores and, and even corporations, anyone can order from Ingram Wholesaler if they have a resale certificate. So my mother cannot order a book from Ingram Wholesaler, but I can because I own an online bookstore and I have a resale certificate and I set up an account with Ingram Wholesaler. So Sue, if you get your book into Ingram Spark and you chuck the box that says, yes, enable for distribution into the marketplace, they will put your book, the cover, the information, the price, the description, everything, including if you've got reviews, you can put all that in. They will put that into databases in the US, in Canada, in the UK, in Australia. Uh, I, I, they're in Germany, they're everywhere. I mean, they're all over the globe. And your book can start being purchased by bookstores. However, the bookstores still need to be contacted. The bookstores need to be told that the books exist so that they can go to Ingram Wholesaler, punch in the ISBN or click on a link in an email and order them. Ingram Spark and Ingram Wholesaler does not make bookstores aware of your book. Yes, you can buy into marketing programs. Quite often, Ingram Wholesaler will offer you a listing in what's called their advanced catalog. Okay, that's great. I have catalogs here that I run that I pitch to libraries and bookstores too as well. That is a, a, that's one great tool. So that is one way to go. But the best and truthfully the most effective way to get into stores is to grab a list of stores that you want to be in, get their email address, find out who the book buyer is, send them an email, tell them about you and your book, and ask them to please order a copy or three or seven, depending on what sort of demand you can expect. Tell them why you think there'll be demand and ask them to order the book from Ingram Wholesaler. So that I hope is a very, very long answer to your question about how Ingram Spark would work and how it would work with bookstores. All right. Anonymous is back with another question. If Anonymous is in draft to digital, does he or she need to be on Smashwords and Ingram ebook distribution? No, no, they are, um, you can be, but there's really no point. Draft to Digital only wants 10% of the net to distribute you everywhere. They get you into Overdrive, which can get you into libraries. They get you into Baker and Taylor's um, 
ebook system. They get you into Kobo, they get you into Nook, they get you into Talcott, they get you into Apple iBooks, they get you, if you want, they'll even put you in Amazon, although it's free to put your book up on Amazon yourself. So I don't know why you would choose that. I, I wouldn't tick that box. But Smashwords and Ingram does not need to be, Smashwords and Ingram does not need to be um, uh, also handled. It's one or the other. I prefer draft to digital to the other two. draft to digital has an easier interface. They've got broader distribution and they charge less than Ingram does. And draft to digital and Smashwords are pretty much on par. I love Mark. I love the work he does there. I use draft to digital just because I like the interface and because they'll take more and more robust types of files. But that might be changing. I don't know. I, I need to get on Smashwords and find out. But if you're on draft to digital, my friend, you are good to go. All right. Um, bum, bum, bum. Uh, let me see if there's any questions here that I can answer. Oh, there's some questions on Facebook. And God bless her little soul. Wendy Jones is messaging me on Facebook. Wendy, I will get back to you. I'm sure the answer is yes. So Karen Hardy, oh, it's good to see you. Karen wants to know if it's still viable to self-publish through Amazon, KDP, both ebook and paperback. She's running a number of businesses. You guys should check this woman out. She's amazing. And she's got a whole bunch of books going. Is it still viable? I want to remind you, guys, you do not publish through KDP. I know that I sound like I'm nitpicking on the language, but you are the publisher. What you do is you print and distribute through KDP. You can print and distribute a book that you are publishing. You publish the book when you create it and distribute it to the marketplace. And KDP is one of the many venues that you can use to distribute and print your book into the Amazon part of our marketplace. Ingram Spark is terrific if you want to print and distribute your book into the brick and mortar retail side of our business. Draft to Digital or Smashwords and Ingram Spark or Ingram Spark, I should say, if you choose to use them, but they will help you format and distribute your ebook into the marketplace. Find Away Voices, they will allow you to create and distribute the audiobook. Publishing your book, Karen, is you. You do not publish your book under KDP. Is it still viable to self publish? It's never been more viable. Never been more viable. I, um, I mean, that's. That's what most of my authors do, and a lot of them make a very nice living at it. I've got a number of authors that I am so proud of, including, I wasn't planning on doing this, but I see her books right here. Speaking of self-published authors, I want to give a shout out and a way to go to Anna Vocino. Her book, Eat Happy 2, it's the second cookbook in a series. The first one was called Eat Happy. Anna had a 10,000 unit print run. Yeah. I'm telling you, she sold them all out already. She's already gone back to the printer. Her book came out this week. So proud of you, Anna. So happy for you. Eat Happy 2, T-O-O. -O. Terrific. It's a gluten-free, grain-free cookbook for those of you who are looking forward to that sort of stuff. Um, so it's, it's amazing. For those of you who are into keto and all of that, check it out. But self-publishing is incredibly viable. People are making a lot of money on it. Hello, Pedro. It's good to see you. Um, and good morning, Robbie. Oh, wow. A lot of lovely people on Facebook. Okay, so I'm going to hop back to the Zoom. I want to remind you guys that if you have questions that you'd like me to answer and I'm not seeing them on Facebook, please go to amysadvice.com and sign up to join me here at right on the webinar because I will answer the questions in the Q&A box. amysadvice.com, there's a big red button there on the page and it will allow you to join me here every Friday at 10 a.m. live. So let's go through some of the questions. A bunch of them have popped up based on what I've already said. Sue wants to know if she should put a barcode with a price on it on her books. Yes, there's no harm in that. I don't know why people get so weird about putting the retail price on their books. It's kind of silly. For those of you who want to change the price of your book willy-nilly, don't. That's a horrible business practice and it shows pretty much an amateurish way to approach your book in the publishing industry. Set a retail price of your book. That's what Macmillan does. That's what St. Martin's does. That's what Random House does. Set a retail price of your book. Set it properly. Get your research done. Check with me if you need to. Pick a real price and stick with it.
You can move your ebook price all around all day long. I don't care. But the print price of your book needs to stay solid. The reason why bookstores really want to see a price specific barcode on their book is for this reason. What if you're a self published author who publishes the book at $20 and they buy the book at $20? And then you decide three months later that you're going to lower the price to $18. And now you're selling it for $18. And the bookstore is still selling the book at 20 because that's what they bought it for. They're not competitive now. What if they want to return it and you say, I'm sorry, but this book is only an $18 book. Now they've just lost out on a buck or two. So you can't do that in business. Set the price of your book, keep it there, embed it in the back of your barcode. I know that Amazon doesn't allow that anymore. And that's fine. The reason why is, well, there's a number of reasons why, but one of the big reasons is Amazon got very tired of authors changing the price of their books and Amazon having to change it on the barcode. They got tired of it, so they don't allow it anymore. That's fine. I don't care about Amazon. Well, I do, but I don't care about their barcodes. But when you put a book up on Ingram Spark, it had better have a price specific um, embedment. Embedment? I don't think that's a word. Embedded in it. Um, if you want to be in my bookstores and if you want to deal with Costco and with Walmart and, and Barnes and Noble and Books a Million, having your price in the back will get you a lot further than if you don't. Uh, someone's asking, uh, should she go with draft to digital or Ingram Spark? It's up to you guys. I'm not going to say to go to one versus the other, but I will tell you that draft to digital takes 10% to, um, takes 10% to distribute your ebook. And I would ask you to go to Ingram Spark and look at your contract and find out how much they charge. I don't know how much it is, but I believe the last time I checked, it was higher than that. So you actually make more money with draft to digital I am not going to tell you which one to go with. Uh, the other thing is draft to digital has a much broader distribution. At the moment, they can get you into more places than Ingram Spark can. All right. Wendy's asking what form of ebook is needed to upload to draft to digital. You should have two forms, Wendy. You should have EPUB, and that goes to the Nooks and the Kobos and for people who have ebook readers, and you should have a Mobi file for people who prefer Kindle. Please don't just do one, do them both. You need a Mobi and you need an EPUB. If you have any questions about how to get those done, there's a woman that I've recommended here on this, uh, on this call many times. Her name is Sumi Goswami. I'd be happy to, to drop her email address in again. And there's also Sundar. Sundar from Medlar Publishing. Both of them are overseas. They're over in India. They do terrific work. I recommend them both highly. All right. Let's see. Um, bum, bum, bum. Is there, Anonymous is asking if there are PR agencies that work for fiction authors. Most of them work with nonfiction. No. Uh, that, well, uh, okay. Huh. Most PR agencies will work with an author, whether they're fiction or nonfiction, but PR agencies have an easier time publicizing and getting press for a nonfiction author who has an area of expertise. That is absolutely true. But Anonymous, there are lots of publishing companies that have tons of experience with fiction. Smith Publicity in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, love them. Smith Publicity. Uh, Dottie, uh, let me get you Dottie's name. Um, <laughs> Marika at PR by the Book. PR by the Book, Marika Flat, F-L-A-T-T. These are PR companies that I can strongly recommend, and I can tell you that they work with novelists and with fiction authors all the time. It's a different sort of job. Now, we here at Bestseller Builders, we work with fiction authors, and we try, but we focus on marketing and PR in this way. With a fiction author, it's all about reviews. We want you in magazines, we want you in newspapers, we want you interviewed by bloggers, we want you on podcasts. But the main, the main focus for us is reviews. So when we work with a fiction client, we focus a lot on reviews. But when we work with a nonfiction client, we work on their level of expertise and we get them out into the media to get a lot of press. With a fiction author, we focus on book clubs and we focus on libraries and newsletters and top 10 lists and, and gift guides. And that's how we would support a fiction author. PR companies who, see, we handle PR and marketing and sales and distribution. We do a lot more than a PR company. But if you're looking for a PR company, there are tons of PR companies that also separate them out. And I would recommend that you reach out to Smith Publicity, Marika, 
um, uh, at PR by the book. Those are two that I would strongly recommend. All right. Sue is asking why I didn't get the price barcode set if I wanted to get into bookstores. Because Marika, this is not the real book. This is an advanced reader's copy. That And the reason why I grabbed it is I knew it didn't have a price because I didn't want to put a retail price of my book on an advanced reader's copy. This is a dummy version. You'll notice it's glossy. We do a couple of things when we send out books for reviews. So a couple of weeks before my book published, I actually created and, and printed this book with a glossy cover, which I don't like glossy usually. I, the real book is matte. And I didn't put a price on the back. This is so we could always differentiate. If I start seeing these puppies on Amazon, if I, I start buying them, and if I get a glossy cover that looks like this, and I've bought it from a third party, I know that one of my bloggers has been selling my review copies. And then I know. Now, and there's nothing I'm going to do about it. But that's why I did this. I, my real book, if you go right now, you'll see my real book, the, the, the true one, does have a price-specific barcode in it. But it's one of the many tricks I do. I'm going to give you another, another little trick. The ISBN of this book is not the ISBN of my real book. This is a completely different ISBN. But I put this up on Amazon. I'm going to give you a little trick. And this is gold, guys. I put this book up on Amazon with an ISBN and I didn't tell anyone about it and I made it as cheap as possible. I think the cheapest Amazon would allow me to make it was $4.65 and I made it $4.65 because that way I could go and buy a bunch of these books and give them to reviewers. I was able to buy them myself and get them much faster. Have you guys tried to order an author copy of your book right now? An author copy of your book from KDP, sometimes it takes you two or three weeks to get your orders. But if you put a version of your book up before your pub date with a different ISBN and you don't tell anyone, don't advertise it, I don't want people finding this one, you then can order dozens or hundreds of copies for only a few cents more than it actually costs to print the darn things. I loved that. And I started sending people to this link. They started writing reviews. So what if you've got a book and you don't want to do pre-orders for a number of reasons, but you want to start getting reviews, you can actually put the paper copy up so you can get print copies faster. Every time I ordered this book, I don't, I hate gloss. Don't you hate that? It's so shiny. But every time I ordered this book, I got it within two days and it cost me $4 and 65 cents because I got free shipping. I, that is less expensive than it costs to order author copies. Not for nothing, guys. A little tip. You might want to check it out. Don't tell Amazon I told you. All right, let's see what else is going on. Um, dum -bum -bum. Thank you, Wendy. I appreciate your support. Uh, Wendy, why do I prefer matte over glossy? Uh, for a couple of reasons. Here, here is a matte book. When I hold it up to the camera, do you see how easy it is to read this? Do you see how beautiful that comes across? Now I'm holding this up to the camera. Look at that shine. Look at that guy. It's, it's, look at that. Ah, come on. So I don't like it for camera purposes. I don't like it for photography purposes. And also, I know this, if you've got a print on demand book, let me find one. Hold on. Uh, print on demand. Here's a print on demand book. Daniel Hall's book, Real Fast Writing. This is Matt. Oh, guys, I don't mean to grope a book in front of you, but you should feel how soft this is. It is like velvet. It's suede. It's gorgeous. This is a classier look. Gloss was great in the 90s, even the early 2000s. We were all about the gloss. We're not about the gloss now. So um, it, now it depends. It depends on your own personal preference. But for photography reasons, for video reasons, for own personal preferences, for those of you who like to, you know, sit at home and fondle Daniel Hall's books, you want to go with Matt. That's my opinion. Please do not tell Daniel Hall that I mentioned that I fondled his books. All right. Let's see what other questions we've got going. It looks like Facebook. We're good to go. So let me go back to the Q&A. Uh, bum, bum, bum. Anna is asking my best advice for initial book signings. Anna, my best advice is don't have a book signing. Don't even have one. Book signings are deadly, but this is what you can do instead. Have an event, have a workshop, have a reading, 
you guys have heard me say this before, sitting at a card table with a stack of books and four Sharpie markers for two and a half hours in the middle of your local bookstore while customers hurry past you trying not to make eye contact, just kind of walking by you, not looking, while you say, would you like to sign my, would you like a signed copy of my, it's awful. It is, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. Uh, it's, please don't do that, Anna. This is what you can do instead. Now, I do not know if your book is a fiction or a nonfiction book. If you want to go to the question box and just type in whether, you know, what type of book it is, that would be awesome. But let's assume you've got a novel. And let's say your event, do not call it a signing. No one wants to go to a signing. They don't care. But that you're doing a reading. Or let's say that the name of your book is called, let's say you are mm, Paula Munir. And you're doing a reading for the, and you're doing an event for Blind Search. You call it an event. And what'll happen is from two to four, at two o'clock, you have the store employee get on the intercom and say, Welcome, you know, bookstore customers. We're so glad you're here. Paula Munir from St. Martin's Press. She and her book, Blind Search, are they're going to be doing an excerpt and a reading and a small Q&A. If you would like to meet a USA Today best-selling author and ask her any questions that you might have about being an author or about how she became, you know, if you've got any questions or if you'd like to discuss this with her, she's going to be doing in five minutes a 10-minute reading from her book, Blind Search. And then she's going to be answering questions. This is totally free. There are cookies and refreshments in the back uh, corner over by the, the uh, sci-fi category. Please go over there, help yourself to the refreshments, help yourself and, and enjoy. And then at 2.30, so you do that. You do your reading, you answer questions. You, you say to people over and over again, um, I'm, you know, signed copies are available. I'd be happy to sign a copy. And a few people will come up if they like you and if they like what they heard and they'll want to sign copy and they'll go buy your book. And then at 2.30, I want the bookstore to say that again. Hello, customers. Polly Munir. We are so pleased to have her here from St. Martin's Press. She's a USA Today bestselling author. Now, Anna, if you're not a USA Today bestselling author, say something else. Um, you know, she's the author of, or she's a... Um, Okay, so Anna, you've got a nonfiction self-help book. You know what? Yes, same advice. Every half an hour, I want the bookstore announcing that you're going to be back there and you're going to be doing something. But Anna, whatever your topic is, let's say your topic is how to help your little brother get over his inferiority complex. And I say that because I'm hoping my little brother is listening. Um, and I only say that because I'm kind of annoyed with him because he made me watch the Giants game last night and it was painful to watch. But if you've got a self-help book about how to help your kid brother get over his inferiority complex, then what I want you to do is put together four very specific, short, 15-minute workshops that you can do at a bookstore. And then they say, oh, you know, uh, Anna Weber, the author of um, uh, Get Over It, Kid Brother, You're a Loser, um, will be teaching, will be, will be doing a 15-minute session on family dynamics and, and, and helping your kid brother get over his low self-esteem. Uh, there'll be refreshments. There'll be, and then at 2.30, when you've been sitting there for a few minutes, you know, Anna Weber, the author of Get Over It, Kid Brother, You're a Loser, uh, will, will be teaching a class on, on, on how to handle the Thanksgiving holiday. You know, if, you know, there, she'll be doing a, a, a brief 15-minute talk on, on dealing with family over the holidays. And then at 3 o'clock, Anna Weber, the author of Get Over It, You're a Loser, will uh, be doing a session on, on how to improve your relationship with your brothers and sisters, um, uh, you know, in three easy steps. There's a million things that you can do and a million ways that you can go about it. Uh, so that's what I would recommend if I were you. All right. And I hope that helped. All right. We're back on a roll with questions. Back on a roll. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm going to guess that your name is pronounced Peely. Peely, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Wants to know if you can have two ISBNs for the same book. No. And does Amazon give ISBNs for print copies or do you get it separately? Let's talk about this. This review copy of my book is not a, a traditionally published book. And there are two different ISBNs. 
But before I put the matte version of my book up, the real version, and I don't have a copy with me because it just got live yesterday. May I recommend you go check out the best-selling author on Amazon and you order it. But I made this out of print. I put this out of print. I took it down from distribution. I pulled it out of print completely. Now, it still exists. If you Google the best-selling author on Amazon, can you Google something on Amazon? You know what I mean. I use Google the way I use the word Xerox and Kleenex. Um, but you can search for the best-selling author on Amazon, and you will see two versions. One is out of print. People can't buy that one anymore. So that is why you would, I would never recommend that you have the same ISBN up at the same time. This is a trick folks. And it's probably a trick that once a couple of you do it, Amazon's going to shut me down and not, not let us do it anymore. But it's a great trick I've been using for the last six months. But you're right. And that was a great question, Peely. I want to make sure you guys shut down the, the cheap $4 version long before you put the, uh, the $14 version up. Peely's asking if Amazon gives ISBNs for print copies or do you get them separately? Peely, your last name is Mukherjee? Mukherjee, I believe. Um, and I don't know if you're based in the United States, but if you're based in the United States and if you, are, um, if you own uh, a U.S. business or if you've got a U.S. bank account, then you would purchase your ISBNs from R.R. Bowker. If you are based in the UK, if you're up in Canada, um, you, will, you can get your ISBNs for free from the Canadian government. Um, if you're in India, I don't know where you get them from, but but what you need to do is just go to the ISBN, International Standard Book Number Agency, for your country. Just Google it, and they will tell you where you can get your ISBN. Please, 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 guys, I'm looking you right in the camera. Do not take a free ISBN from anyone, anyone that is not a registered ISBN distributor. In the United States, that leaves two options, Bowker and Ingram Spark that sells ISBNs from Bowker. Please, please, please do not take a free ISBN from KDP ever. That means that I know you get to keep the copyright and you're the publisher and they put your name on the book and your publisher name on the book, but the truth is what they don't tell you and what too many people don't realize is that Amazon owns that ISBN and the distribution rights. You will not be able to take that ISBN everywhere you want to go. You will not be able to pick up and put that ISBN and that book with that ISBN into different marketplaces without Amazon. And that is not acceptable. This is your book. You are the publisher. You need to own the ISBN. Do not take a free ISBN from KDP, ever. I hope I was clear on that. All right. Anonymous is asking if Barnes & Noble and Baker and & Taylor are for libraries. No. So they also require, bar okay, Barnes & Noble is a bookstore chain. And they, they sell into, uh, they've got a whole bunch of bookstores on colleges and universities, but they also have public bookstores on public thoroughfares and in the marketplace. Barnes and Noble is strictly a bookstore chain and they require barcodes. They don't require, they strongly suggest that you put a price on the barcode of your book. Baker and Taylor is a wholesaler, not a retailer. Barnes and Noble is a retailer. Baker and Taylor is a wholesaler that sells exclusively to libraries. For those of you, including Wendy Jones, if she's listening, for those of you who say, but wait, Baker and Taylor distribution tells me that they sell to, to bookstores. That's true. Baker and Taylor, remember I said, Ingram wholesaler is different than Ingram distribution? Well, same is true for Baker and Taylor. Baker and Taylor wholesaler is different from the division of Baker and Taylor distribution. Baker and Taylor distribution will sell directly to a bookstore for you, but none of you guys are going to be able to get into Baker and Taylor distribution. Unless you're millionaires who have tons of money to burn, it's not going to happen. So in your case, Miss or Mr. Anonymous, Baker and Taylor, the wholesaler, is for libraries, and they don't care about prices and the barcodes. All right. If you are going to consciously choose to not put a price-specific barcode on your book, I have no problem with that. Just know that you're going to have a harder time getting into bookstores. I'm all right with that. Lots of people don't even want to do bookstores. Most, a lot of my authors don't want to sell returnable. Bookstores aren't an option for them anyway. I have no problem with that. Uh, Annette's asking how to generate and manage royalty reports across several platforms. Annette, when I had a distribution company, I did it with Excel. I, I don't know how to, I'm, I'm afraid I am an English, you guys have heard me say this. I'm an English major with a music degree. 
I am afraid you do not want me uh, telling you how to manage royalty reports. I can barely, barely, you know how um, my friend Sandy Beckwith, I loved this. She talked about how the way she would, ba- she said online the other day, the way she would balance her checkbook is she would close out the account to just start fresh. Uh, yeah, that's uh, Sandy and I are friends for a reason. So um, what I would recommend, Annette, is that um, what I do is I had an assistant and I had them pull all the books and all the authors and put it in five or six different columns in an Excel sheet every week for me. Um, but I'm afraid I don't have a lot of advice for that. I apologize. Uh, Denise is asking what to do with the fake ISBN and price after. I believe I answered that, but I just want to be clear in case I wasn't. You retire it, get rid of it. Uh, you know, you can't ever, it will not disappear off of Amazon, but after a couple of weeks, nobody's going to see that other edition. It's just going to be an out of print edition that doesn't exist. You can change the price if you want to $400 just to keep people from ordering it, but there you go. Uh, Sue is saying that I have a program that I have a program to help people get into bookstores, like my library program that I offer a few times a year. And is that a, uh, is that a good fit for her? Can you, Sue, I don't know if it's a good fit for you, but anyone who's interested in that, make sure you join my newsletter. If you go to newshelves.com, you will get an option to join my newsletter. And when we offer that next, I'll be happy to send you. But what we do here is I am not a big fan of just depending on my mailings, but they are nice. My, what, my, what we do is we put five, six, maybe six books into an email. And we send them out in small groups over and over again to different bookstores around the country. You have to be returnable. You have to be available through a wholesaler like Ingram. There's a lot that has to happen for you to be appropriate for this mailing. But if you're available from a wholesaler and if you're returnable and if your book is good and if it's priced right, if it's not a 40-page pamphlet that you're trying to charge $32 for without a spine, you might be perfect for the bookstore mailing. We do these four times a year. Our next one is going to be in January. We just finished one up. And we sell, we send small batches of books by theme. So Sue, for you, you might get your own mailing for heaven's sakes, because I don't know too many, you know, gymnast theme books, but we put the books together by theme and, and we send them to bookstores and we strong and we follow up several times. And that's what that program's all about. It's $399, $399. We do it four times a year. We're not doing one right now until after January. We just finished up the last one for the year. But, uh, but thank you for asking. That's very kind. Very sweet. All right. Let's see. Ah, apparently, Peely, um, uh, I did answer the questions right. I'm thrilled to hear that. Let's see if there's any more comments. I believe that's all my questions on Facebook. There's two more questions. We've got 10 more minutes, guys, before Free Advice Friday is over. Oh, Anonymous has asked me to repeat the name of the PR agencies. I can do better than that. I can even put, hold on one second. Let me put their websites in the chat box. Let's see. I am not above Googling in uh, Smith Publicity, it's called. And it is www.smithpublicity.com. I am not above dropping a, um, a URL right into the box and Googling right in front of you. I'll Google in public. What the heck? All right. It's the end of the hour. What are you guys going to do? Fire me? And let me drop this into the chat box. Chat. And... There we go. There's the Smith's publicity. I'm also going to do the same thing. I'll drop it into Facebook for those of you who are listening on Facebook. And the other one that I wanted to look up is PR by the book. Marika and her group are terrific. I love both of these guys. Yep. PRbythebook.com. And let me drop that into the chat box. There's others. If you reach out to those two and you don't like them, um, then, then I'll find you someone else. But I do love those two. Uh, Susan is asking how you print a few books before the main printing of your book. Well, Susan, I covered that. Throw a a fake dummy ISBN on it, uh, upload it to Amazon, don't tell anyone, print a couple hundred copies or however many you need, and then what you can do is you can go to discountlabels.com, discountlabels.com, and get a one and three-quarter inch 
by two inch. So this, you can get a one and three quarter by two inch sticker and you can get a whole sheet of them printed with your correct ISBN and barcode on it. And they'll be at your office by Thursday or, you know, go to, go get an Avery label and do it yourself on your laser printer. But I go to discountlabels.com and then you can slap your real ISBN on the back of this. If you want to print them and sell them with the correct ISBN to bookstores, let's say that your launch is coming up and you want to print a bunch of these really cheap for like $4 a piece. Do the trick I told you. Get them in your office or in your house. You and your, and your ne'er-do-well niece who needs something to do, cover this barcode with the real barcode, with a real sticker. And then drive over to your local bookstore and hand them a stack of 12 or 15 or however many books they asked for, given to them with the right ISBN, good to go, golden. They will sell them, and then by the time they sell through those, your real book will be printed, and you can repa replace them. All right. Annette is asking if she should move her book from Lightning Source to Ingram Spark. No. Uh, uh, Annette, Ingram Spark is simply just the front facing interface for small presses. Ingram Spark is run by Lightning Source. It's, it's the machine behind it is, is Lightning Source. So if you've got a boxer engine, in your Porsche, you're in great shape. Now they may also put the boxer engine in something else, but you don't need to sell your car and go buy a Porsche just to get the boxer. You already have the engine. Don't do anything. You're in great shape. All right. Um, all right. I, I did put the PR agencies in. Um, Anonymous is asking me if I can talk about PR and rights distribution. I can, but I'm afraid we only have five minutes left. So this is what we're going to do, Anonymous. I have a video on my YouTube channel, um, and it was me interviewing a woman named Anna Termini. Anna Termini. If you go to youtube.com slash Amy Collins, youtube.com slash Amy Collins, and on the search bar, just type in rights or Anna, or, or just look down. It's not that far down. I don't have that many videos. You will see an interview that I did with Anna Termini. She is a 25-year veteran about selling rights, and she gave me a terrific interview. It's totally free. Obviously, it's YouTube. I would suggest you watch that, that, um, that video. For those of you who do not like to watch video, who don't have that kind of time, that interview just this week was transcribed and it's going to be my blog on Monday. So anonymous, subscribe to my blog. If you go to newshelves.com slash blog and subscribe, you will actually get the entire answers that you're looking for in, my, in your, your blog newsletter that you get. All right, we have five minutes left. We've got a couple of questions. Someone's texting me. I hope it's someone who loves me. All right. It is. Uh, Ellie's saying regarding the library book mailing, she did this and asked Connor if she could get a copy of the mailing, but all he showed me was my book and not the email. Oh yeah, of course. Um, Ellie, I apologize. We'll get that to you. And how do you see your sales on Ingram? Is this limited? Yes. Uh, Ellie, you're not going to be able to see. If you've got a publisher, you, you have no way of seeing what your sales are. I'm afraid you're going to have to ask them if there was a spike in sales. And of course you can see the email. Um, you should be, you should have gotten a copy and I apologize, but I will run over and talk to Connor about that after. Um, yeah, no, these mailings that we do, um, we, now we do create a page for each of your books and maybe he got confused. I don't know what the deal was, but we'll fix it. Not a big deal. Of course. Uh, Wendy's asking if I can put the names of the ebook formatters that I mentioned up. I absolutely can. But guys, I, let me look it up real quick on my phone so that I'm, I make sure that I get it right. Sue me. All right. And her email, let me put this into the chat box, is sumi.goswami.pub at gmail.com. Love her. And then my favorite, and someone, if you want an interior designed as well, I would recommend, um, I use Sumi for most of my eBooks. I use Sundar at Medlar Publishing, sundar at medlar.in. I use him for eBooks, but I also use him for interiors. Love Sundar. Um, he does a very nice job, very inexpensively for three or four dollars a page. You can get your interiors laid out beautifully and in InDesign. Love it. 
So I hope that, Wendy, that that was helpful. All right, we have one last question, and then I, let me just check Facebook to make sure there's nothing else there. Um, bum, bum, bum. I don't see anything else. We've got one more. Oh, two more questions. Sue just slid one in. Okay. Two questions from Sue and then I am done until next Friday. I will be back here. I promise. Uh, next Friday on, um, on free advice Friday at 10 AM. I am here every week. And when I am not my coworker, Carrie is, I hope you guys have a wonderful holiday celebrating indigenous people. I, uh, yes, I'm one of those people who don't actually want to call it Columbus day. And if you don't know why I don't want to call it Columbus day, may I suggest you go to the oatmeal.com oatmeal, like the cookies and, uh, go to the oatmeal.com and you will find out why I'm not a big fan. All right. Uh, Peely's asking for the email uh, for my folks. Guys, this is why I am begging you to go to amysadvice.com. I am begging you, go to amysadvice.com and, um, and sign up to join us live because this way you will have, I, I try very hard to, um, to answer these questions. Uh, let's see, reply to Peely, to, to answer them both in Facebook and live. But um, I don't know if I always can. So here they are, Peely. There's the email addresses. All right. Let me answer Sue's question. And then I will see you guys back here next Friday. Uh, Sue is asking if reviewers need to purchase the glossy book to get verified reviews. Sue, I'm not talking about Amazon reviews. Go. I no longer approach Amazon reviewers and ask them to leave Amazon reviews. The rules have changed. You're not allowed to do that anymore. According to Amazon's community guidelines, reaching out to Amazon reviewers or to readers and asking them to buy and then review your book is soliciting a review, and that is not acceptable. It used to be. It, I know it changes every couple months. So I understand why you're confused. If they leave a review on your glossy book, once you change the ISBN, the reviews won't work. That's a separate question, which I will answer in a moment. But let me start by asking, answering the question you didn't ask. You're asking people to buy the glossy version of your book to get a verified review on Amazon. That is not the, purchase, the purpose of my glossy plan. I buy these books myself. I never ask anyone else to buy them. I'll buy a couple hundred and I will send them out to reviewers because I can get them fast and I can get them cheap. The whole, now, if nine reviewers, if they decide, I am not asking them to do this, if they decide to go to Amazon, Look for my book, search for it, put a review up that I did not ask them to do. And then what happens when my new book comes out with a different ISBN? Well, I have an answer for that. What you want to do is you go to Author Central, you give them the old ISBN, the old ASIN number, you give them the new Amazon standard uh, information number, ASIN number, and you tell them that these are the same book and to please combine them. Ask them to make sure that the reviews are ported over that, that, because it's the same book and they will happily do that. And those nine reviews that you did not ask for because that is against Amazon's community guidelines, then turn around and they show up on the new book or your book. Now, as people are buying my new book, I'm going to tell you all day long. I'm telling you right now on Free Advice Friday, if you buy my book, I'd love it if you'd write a review. Write a review anywhere you want. Write it online. Send it to me in an email. I don't care. Write a review. I'd be so honored. That's the most I do now. I do not ask people to go to Amazon and write a review. It is against their guidelines, and I don't need the hassle. Let reviews come organically or not, but Amazon is no longer in the, uh, in the business, or are they interested in supporting becoming a Yelp? That's not what they're there for. Um, Sue's wanting to know if I saw her question, and yes, I believe I just answered it. So there we go. It is 11 o'clock. Nailed it. Top of the hour. There I am. I am thrilled that I was able to spend this hour with you. I will be here next Friday. Uh, bye, Wendy. Great to see you. Um, I will see you next Friday on Free Advice Friday. I'm here every Friday. And if I'm not, Carrie Barnum is. And uh, right now she's down in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania with her family visiting for the long holiday weekend. She and I will be back uh, and around. Please, please go to amysadvice.com. Sign up to join us here live every week. Please friend me on Facebook if you'd like to, or go to Amy Collins New Shelves. Go to bestsellerbuilders.com. Check us out. I would love to be of help, and I'll see you next week on Free Advice Friday.